then? What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should it be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. All right, you're welcome along to Thursday night's football show. Kev is still in the studio. How are you keeping? Very good. All's great. On the travels this week, but all's good, yeah. You, got, you got over Sunday? I did, yeah. Oh, yeah. your face, Kev. <laughs> your face when Jordan Pickford but picked that ball from behind the goal. It was over the goal line. It was uh, over the line. It just seemed as... Really, obviously, we were sat in the Liverpool end. It just seemed I had... Wherever I turned that day, I just had Liverpool supporters around me. Wherever I turned that day, that's wherever all it was. Turned, wherever oh, I turned, face, yeah. Kev, was, was, yeah. was a sight to behold. Yeah. Throughout the game as well, it was just one of those, wasn't it? Yeah, but hey, you got to you got to get through it. Um, I feel as though there's there's a there's, there's going to be a turnover the next few years. That's what I feel. I feel. Oh really? There's, I feel there's there's something there's something happening. Yeah. At there's Everton. Something happening. Blue half of Everton. Yeah. They might actually win a derby at Anfield. Uh, and more. And more. And yeah. more. And more. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What are you hearing? No, I'm just I'm just hopeful further down the line now that there's going to be a, a, a more powerful Everton side, and I feel as though that uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that Everton um, Everton will get a lot stronger. I do feel it. Yeah. Andre Gomez is probably going to be a key to that. A key to keep him, isn't it? So Marco Silva was talking on Monday about it, and obviously now suddenly everybody's talking about Andre Gomez and how influential he is after playing we so well. We spoke about it before the game, though, didn't mm. we, as well, and how well he'd been playing. You and I both commented, I think we said it, it was Burnley, I think, um, when they just looked so good when, 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 he was in the game, when he was in the game to start the match, and he, he didn't look fit. He actually, he's actually looked to me like he's lost a bit of weight from, from his debut. But it's just how hard he is. Lads hitting him, bouncing off plays. He looks so strong, so comfortable in possession. Can beat a player as well. He's, he's the all-round. He's a complete package, yeah. Yeah, Mark Silva said, obviously, listen, we want to make that happen. But you look at his performances and you'd have to wonder what price. I know, that's it. 50 million? Yeah. Would that be fair enough? He went for 40 million last year, didn't he, to Barcelona? So it, it didn't quite work out for him when he was over there at Barca. So, yeah, this rate, yeah, it is. That's the way it is. What did they pay for Yerry Mean? Is it 30? Mm. It's, well, it's somewhere in excess of 40, isn't it? Certainly 35 plus, that's the way I would think uh, Sterling, I would imagine so, yeah. Do you genuinely think that Everton can contend for top four again? Uh, four or not five this years. season? No, no, not definitely not this season, of course. Uh, four or five years down the line, yeah, I'd be, I'd be hopeful enough, certainly. I think it is... And is that with the investment I, that's possibly coming into possibly the Possibly coming in, yeah. I, I, I just think that... I just think... Get get stable first. For, far too often we're, we're thinking when Everton have what spent two or three hundred million over the last few years. I don't know the exact figure. You, Mr. Statman, would know that with all the stats you were feeding in my year. A lot of money is how I would describe it. A lot of money. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I would say. But we know there's a lot of money gone in, and it's almost as if that money's in. Right, we need an instant results, and yes, it is. But how far were they behind? Even Spurs, how far were they behind that top four, mm. those top four sides? And they were competing for a number of years. You know, they'd done it under Koeman, they did it under Martinez, they did it under Moyes at the back end, but they just weren't able to, to, to get that consistency. So it is about reinvesting again. And, and I, it, I know, again, it, it seems, it seems um, huge the amount of money that, that, that will have to be invested, but that's the way it's got to be. And I think that that money will be available the next few years, yeah. Do you think Seamus Coleman's at Everton for the rest of his career? I, I'm just asking because obviously there were questions by Everton supporters about his form since returning from injury. But watching and having covered a lot of Everton games over the past month, he just seems to be pretty much back to his yeah. best. And maybe it is, again, play. It, it was noticeable, I thought, against Liverpool. Every time Andre Gomez drifted over to the right-hand side and Coleman knew that he could trust him, yeah. that if he gave the ball to Gomez, he could make the run forward and Gomez would pick him out and he'd be in a good position and he'd play the right ball where I feel sorry for Coleman in a way playing behind Theo Walcott because it, I can't imagine they're ever going to end up in the same wavelength. Well, it, it's, he's a runner. It, it, Seamus has to support from behind. Mm. It, it, it's because you know for a fact that he's, Theo Walcott's very much a head-down player, wants to go and beat plays. He's not necessarily... A, a, I don't want to be doing a disservice, but he's not a clever player that likes to come inside and play as a, an inside forward. You know, the position that Christian Eriksen or Deli Ali would like to play where they play quite narrow, to, like two number 10s essentially, or outside forwards. He isn't that type of player. He's, he's more direct. So in turn, in doing that, mm. with him running forward, Seamus Coleman has to support from behind. The, the, the games don't suit each other. I mean, it's something you even said it at the weekend, even you, even you, Nathan, said at the weekend that both fullbacks were sitting a bit deeper. It was more... Both he and, and Luca Dean sit in and support him from behind and get forward, albeit 
will be infrequently. Just get forward when you can. And that's how it worked. It worked for Everton in the first half. They were playing very much counter-attacking football, but it, it was working. They, they actually did well with it. Adam Ola Luckman came in last night and probably would have started as well in the derby. It seems only he'd picked up a little bit of an injury ahead of Theo Walcott. Yeah. Would playing with Luckman suit Coleman more? I'm thinking more in that attacking yeah. sense where, as you say, there's no point Coleman bombing forward down the right wing because Walcott does that once you get into the opposition yeah. half. I, I, is is uh, I think it's probably an upgrade for Everton the way it certainly looked at the weekend mm. when 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 Ad, uh, Adam Adam Mola Luckman I'll get it right again uh, when he came on but no I I don't see that sort of that sort of relationship gelling uh, Everton's best relationship over the last ten years was was uh, Leighton Baines and Stephen Pienaar they were so good together the movement from Pienaar such a clever footballer was Baines Pienaar a smart footballer on. yeah very good very good footballer the movement he had even when Mikel Arteta used to sometimes played on the left hand side or the right hand side I think I think. That type of player with with Seamus Coleman would be brilliant. Seamus can just set off, continue his run, be brave with his running, knowing full well that he's got a player that's clever enough to pick out a pass. That's why why that relationship with Baines and Pino was so good. So that's the sort of thing that I, I support, or sort of player I feel as though that that, that that would suit Coleman. But it just depends on what Marco Silva sees. I don't feel as though Richarlison is at his best when he's playing through the middle. I, he scored last night, or you know, he's, he, he's a goal threat, yes, and I think he's going to get goals for Everton, but I think you can get so much more of him playing, playing a little deeper. bit deeper, or in a wide area, I feel, as or maybe floating into areas. Everton are short a major centre forward. Idrissi, Idrissi Garner Gay, again, I don't, think, I don't think he's brilliant. I don't think he's certainly not brilliant on the ball, decent at breaking stuff up. But I think if Everton are going to progress and they're going to go forward, they're still three or four short of being that real top side. We're going to talk about Southampton a little bit later in the football show as well. Rob Daly will join us because Southampton have a new manager following the sacking of Mark Hughes. Rolf Hassenhutl. It's impossible to say about his him name. Without it's impossible to say his name without putting on an Austrian slash German accent. Yeah. I was trying to do it in my Mayo voice, but I just can't do it. <laughs> Hassenhutl. Hassenhutl. You want to go all in. Hassenhutl, yeah. I can say it. Uh. <laughs> yeah, it's a thing of beauty. Yeah, I, I, it's a straight. It's, well, it's, it's one of these that's come from from out of nowhere again, isn't it? Really, you're not expecting that name, but that's what that's what Southampton have have done, mm. haven't they? It's, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how that one goes. Yeah, Southampton are interesting in a way because they're uninteresting. They were mm. such an enjoyable club to go and watch for three, four, five years ago when Kuman was there, when Pochettino was there. It was yeah. one of the best places to go and watch football, and very much felt as though they were setting the bar for mid-level Premier League clubs of what you could achieve, how you could run a business, how you could develop young players. It can fall apart pretty quickly. Look at Swansea. Swansea are that type. They were that mm. type, weren't they? That They were almost the, the benchmark for so many sides. Do it like these for a number of years and just get stable. Stoke were probably another one, how, how they tried to build. They never really got away from maybe that old style Stoke. They were always considered that direct uh, style of football. But Do you put Southampton's problems simply down to selling their best players. Yeah, but it was always going to catch up with them, wasn't it? it how Does it affect the dressing room? Because the obvious thing is, well, if you're getting rid of... Yeah. Well, Toby Alderweireld was never there on a permanent basis, but he leaves, then Virgil van Dijk leaves, yeah. that automatically you're never going to be able to keep recruiting the same quality look, of players. Look, 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 but, to Adam Lallana, mm. um, Dejan Lovren, you know, all these players that they've had, that it does set in the dressing room, because what happens in a dressing room is... He's going, he is trebling his money, he's quadrupling his money to go to one of these clubs. There is interest in me, I want a piece of that. And that, I'm stuck here. It is a bit like that, it is. Luke Shaw's another one as well, of course, isn't he? And uh, it, it, Of course, maybe you, sometimes you've got to know your level, but there's a number of players that's even within that club now that you think, yeah, they could have moved on, they could have, they could have gone at the right time, but it's just not quite happened. I mean, Southampton are big payers, don't, don't forget. They are big payers, are as are a lot of Premier League. Yeah, big, big payers, yeah. And there's in a Premier League terms or just in world football terms now? Oh, you probably say in world football terms. There's probably outside your... Would be top 10 Premier League? Top 10 Premier League, yeah. Certainly for top, top, um, top paid players, um, they'd be certainly right up there. Yeah, some of their top paid players would be right up there, yeah. Grand a week? Yeah. Up, up, up near enough, yeah. Near enough, yeah. Um, so that's where you look at. I mean, Leicester put themselves onto that level and beyond when they won the Premier League with with certain players. Um, Everton now are starting to get up uh, around that on a more regular basis as well. Um, but yeah, certainly top ten, yeah, definitely. So the last couple of nights, it's as you were at the top with Manchester City and Liverpool. Liverpool caught up a little bit in terms of the goal difference, the way they yeah. What did you think of that with that Burnley? coming back? It was, I think it was almost as, as important beating. 
winning last night against Burnley as it probably was winning that winning that derby. Oh well, last night felt like it was an incredibly tough game for yeah. Liverpool because they'd made so many changes. They've got a couple of injuries. We're hearing today Joe Gomez is going to be out for the next six to eight weeks with a bad leg injury. Away at Burnley, even though they're struggling, like. It's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason. It's a bloody tough place to go yeah, to when yeah. you have a group of players who've never played together before. Once the Burnley goal went in, I thought Liverpool responded very, very well. But again, midfield seemed to be the problem. Yeah, it is, yeah. When they go direct from back to front and they bypass the midfield, it looks very, very good. Yeah, yeah. But they just, at no stage did you feel that Henderson was putting his stamp, that he was the standout yeah. midfielder. He, do, he doesn't look fit to me, Henderson, for some reason as well. I, I, watching him in that um, Red Star Belgrade game last week, had no influence on the mm. game. Plenty of running, plenty of pointing again from him without having any influence or any sort of positioning to get on the ball. That's what I felt with Henderson. Alongside him, Mil Milner's, Milner's the best footballer. Like, and you know, Milner in in many respects was was told to leave or he could leave Man City because he was never going to get a game in his preferred position playing in midfield. And so that's where you look. Liverpool are nowhere near that level that that Man City is setting. They're not. I was at Man City uh, the other night at, down at Vicarage Road watching them at Watford, and, and City just City cruised through the game. It was. I, I didn't. I didn't rate Watford's game plan at all. How they went about it. They, they had. Why real, would they do? Well, they had physical players that could have really put it up to them, and all they did. They had a great chance with Troy Deeney to go in front of the first half, and that and that was literally one of the, probably the only occasion they got in City's half or City's penalty area. It was very timid from them. Then all of a sudden they scored with about five or six minutes to go and it was like, get it forward into Dean, let's go a bit more direct. And City were all over the place. Now, it, you maybe look at that, they could have done that 20, 30 minutes earlier, yes. Yeah. But the difficulty is he's getting the ball off them. Are we still underestimating Liverpool, though, in terms of potentially winning the league? Th yeah, definitely, because there's more to come from them. I think they can play a lot better. I, they, they've... You know how many points have they taken off City, or how many times have they played against City in the last year, unbeaten across the course of this year, four times, isn't it? Now to the two Champions League, two Premier League games, unbeaten against them, they can beat Man City. They can. They've proved they can do that. It's. it's you just feel they need a spark. So like the way this weekend's, you're at. Are you at Bournemouth Liverpool? I'm at Bournemouth Liverpool this weekend. So that's yeah. the early game. Yeah. And it gives Liverpool a chance to go top. Yeah. And finally, put a bit of pressure on City ahead of their game against Chelsea, which is the late game. Yeah. And then you really feel for Liverpool to have a title challenge, to get the belief in the squad that they need Chelsea to take something off City, that they, are, they aren't bulletproof, that yeah. actually there's some flaw there that might suggest that other teams will take points off yeah, City. Yeah, exactly. And you don't think that's going to happen the way Chelsea have gone over the last couple no. of weeks. The only, the only thing I say with, with this at the weekend is I think it's going to be an amazingly credible game for Liverpool, only because they've played last night then they've got no recovery time before it's a 12.30 kickoff. I'm sure this is going to be mentioned, Klopp will probably mention this in his, in his uh, press conferences prior to the match, that Liverpool's recovery time is... Well, it's madness. It's virtually nil, really. That's Because they go straight from this to playing Napoli in midweek in their most important Champions League game of the season. Yeah. And then they've Manchester United yeah, next weekend. And then you're properly into the Christmas yeah, I know. period. In fact, I was thinking that watching the games over the last couple of nights. There was definitely a time when this was the best time of the year for watching football because... There are so many games. Every three days, there's big matches. There's football yeah. on TV pretty much every night of the week. Whereas now you're going, well, half the players aren't playing. Yeah. Watching Liverpool last night in front of half-empty stadiums because the fans can't afford to go. The Burnley Stadium was nowhere near. Burnley, delighted to be playing Premier League football, yeah. can't sell out their home games against Liverpool. 35,000 at Wembley to watch Spurs last night. It feels as though they need this winter break because what's the point of having this crucially important month of football if the best best players can't play, it is. And uh, you can say you can. Uh, you, I, I've said it. I have said it for years that you cannot get the recovery time in, into your body this time of the year. You can't. Liverpool now going down to Bournemouth. They'll get a flight probably Friday morning. I would imagine Friday afternoon. They'll have no time in the training ground. No real real time to, to prepare for it. So that's the problem that they've got. And I used to think. I, yes, I used to love playing twenty sixth, twenty eighth, thirty first, New Year's Day, whatever it was around December time but it was it was it took its toll on you it really did and you come off the back of it and it's almost as you needed that br breather and then you've got an FA Cup tie on the what the 4th or the 5th mm. or whatever it's going to be so it, it does take its toll on you it really does and did you figure out ways as your career went on to ease the pain <laughs> well, just around the time we're talking about um, <laughs> injections and everything like that. Um, Is there any special doctors you went to, Kevin? I know, I did, I did, no, never, never, honest to God. No, but did, you, did you notice from the start of your career to the end of your career there was a big improvement in rest, recovery, recuperation, in, into how you handled that? 
Yeah, do you know what it was? I, I don't necessarily see it as a, you're, you're a young lad as well, that you're fresher. I don't, I just think your body, your body to take that many games, you can't take it no matter how old you are. That's the way it was. When you get a bit older, you probably get more aches when you're getting up in the morning, that, that constant thigh burn. Don't get that thigh burn in the morning that I used to get all the time. You just get out of bed and you would try, you're getting down the stairs. Honestly, first three or four steps and it was just like, <sighs> used to get it every single morning. That was enough to training, so that, that was the killer I always felt, yeah. But obviously now, don't get that. You don't get that anymore. No, luckily <laughs> enough, no. <laughs> Good man. Yeah, so uh, Bournemouth, Liverpool, this is a... This is a definite, you get your three points and you get the hell out of Goals, here. goals. You we, think so? We've had, we had a lot of goals in this fixture over the, over the last four, one. 4-3 last there? season, was it? Yeah, I think it was. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think the way that Bournemouth are playing, good win for them the other night, wasn't mm -hmm. it, uh, for them? They're playing good attacking football. Callum Wilson's looking a real threat for them. It's just when we're watching Van Dyke at the weekend, though, and everything just looks so easy for him. And you think at the weekend, Van Dyke, you know, you might, you might know his team's struggling a little bit. Just lock on to Callum Wilson a little bit because Callum Wilson simply won't be able to outrun him. So that could be a key battle this weekend for them, really. Is Van Dyke somehow above resting? Well, he's, he seems to have the cigar out every time he plays, doesn't he? He doesn't even seem to break sweat half the time. I, I have to play him. I, Liverpool, if, 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 if you dropped him or rested Klopp, mm. uh, uh, Van Dyke, if Klopp rested him, then. Liverpool wouldn't look half the team. They wouldn't because they're not playing the attacking brand of football that we saw last season. So you're immediately taking that out the side as it is and then you've not got Van Dijk where the defence looks stable. It'll probably go back to how it was last season. So, yeah, it, it desperately need, need him to, to stay in the side, yeah. Well, what Joe Gomez has done over the last year has been pretty incredible considering mm -hmm. how much football he missed with a horrific injury and he's established himself as England centre-half, very much first choice alongside <laughs> Van Dijk at Liverpool. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as a proper full-scale blow for Liverpool that he's going to be out for the next six weeks? Or having Lovren and Matip there, do you feel with Van Dijk alongside them actually yeah. they're okay now? A little bit. It, it, would, it would certainly be a worry. You can, you can, you can clearly see it. Trent Alexander-Arnold, I'd feel that I, I, it, with, with Andy Robertson outside Van Dijk, it, it's just, you can see him on the pitch, organised, cool, calm. I think he probably, you think he needs an experience there to, he, you, essentially you'd say he's gotten with Dejan Lovren, but Dejan Lovren constantly makes errors in trying to win the ball, where Van Dijk sometimes lets it bounce and you think, you get, you can't, but he just controls the situation really well. If Van Dijk, if, uh, sorry, if Lovren lets it bounce, there's carnage. Mm. Trent Alexander-Arnold lets, lets players run off his shoulder. He doesn't see runners. He struggles in that, in that uh, aspect of his game up to now. So if he's got someone like Lovren that's quite erratic inside him, that right side Liverpool defence could be a problem, I'd say, yeah. We'll have updates on that game throughout Saturday's show. Reporters at all the matches, goals as they go in, as always. And then on Sunday, we will have full live commentary of Newcastle against Wolves. I'll be alongside Pat Nevin at St. James's Park. Wolves, I saw maybe questions been raised about their temperament and their mentality that yeah. they can get up for the big games like last night against Chelsea where they put in their best performance in a couple of months. Like, Do you see that from them? That, I don't know if you call them prima donnas, but that mm. already, even though it's their first season back in the Premier League, that they're looking around and a lot of the time they just don't fancy it? Um, that been a bit harsh? Not, well, it probably is a bit harsh. You're, you're, quite, like, you're going to fancy it you're in quite, St. James' you're quite a harsh Park man, really, aren't you? Yeah. Um, I mean, Newcastle got a great result there at Goodison, didn't they, um, last night, so the other night. So that, that's something that goes in their favour straight away. I'd look at Wolves. Wolves are the only side I've seen seriously give City trouble this mm. season. Brilliant on the counter-attack, how they played that day. A different, a different style of football than what we would be uh, used to watching with Wolves. So it's, I think it's a great chance for them to play a brand of football there where they can really go at them. Um, go at them. You say, I think it was maybe... A, a, a similar sort of style how they got that win against Chelsea as it would have been against Man City when they've had to dominate possession when they've had to go and beat teams that's where they struggle so it's not necessarily saying look you, you can't raise your game because it's Newcastle there's almost a way of playing to, to beat those better sides they've got real pace in the side uh, that, that can hurt sides so that's why they play that way and I think that's what maybe they're better suited to playing so that's something that maybe does go against them when they've got to play a side like Newcastle and what about Chelsea Man City the late game on Saturday? Obviously Chelsea going through a bit of a dip. Yeah. Really ever since those comments about Angola Kante. Yeah, I know. Um I think City win it. I can't see City not scoring. So if, if Chelsea are gonna have to if, are going to win it, they've got to score two. Um I'd say the way that Chelsea have been defending, I think City are, score, are going to score more than one. So that means they've got to score three if Chelsea's gonna win. I just can't see Chelsea scoring three goals against Man City, no. All right, good stuff, Kev. You're going to stick with us. Uh, we're going to take a very quick break and we're going to be talking about the new Southampton manager, Ralph Hasenhutl, next. 
I'm sorry, you can sit there and look and play with all your silly machines as much as you like. What does that mean? Fit to spit? I don't really know what you mean. Angry, upset, frustrated, steaming. No. Only in, in uh, sex masochism. Then it is allowed. Well, I appreciate you not putting my hair, thank you. Yeah, okay. Where did this ferocious determination out there today come from? The media! Every one of them brought us off. Somebody's out to get me. We've been shagged by Dublin. We've been ridden rock solid by people in Dublin. Had you known more pressure on you, more questions about you in your 19-year tenure here? Nah, it's absolute bollocks. Did you think coming in with a 69 that you could even consider yourself a six shot back? <laughs> it's the first round of the golf tournament. Just calm yourself. There's an awful long way to go yet. How do you man? Jock Wallace, congratulations. What is it, Brendan? What would it be? Let me think. Uh, I can't, I'm not sure. I'll have to think about that one. Think about it deeply. So you're not going to draw me in it and you have a look at all the facts, you'll see my, I have no comment to make. You've made your name as a wheeler and dealer. There's not no, been much not wheeling and dealing, has it? No, I'm not a wheeler and dealer. <laughs> no, that's not. Oh, sorry, didn't mean like that. Don't say that. I'm a fucking football man. Football on Off The Ball. In association with the faster than ever Boyle Sports app with hundreds of pre-live and in-play football markets. Download it now. Boyle Sports. Time to play. As you know, on Lunchtime Live, we like to rip up the running order and go completely unscripted. And tomorrow, we're handing over the reins to you once again. We want you to share your stories and set the agenda on Friday's show. Any topic, any area, from anyone. You have full control for the two full hours. Email us your ideas now on lunchtimelive at newstalk.com and have your say. Lunchtime Live. And unscripted. With Kira Kelly. Thanks to Video Doc. Tomorrow from midday. On News Talk. This Christmas at the perfume shop, we have the perfect gift for that someone special. Like Mark Jacobs, Divine Decadence. 47 euros for a 50 mil, saving 40 euros and 50 cents of the RRP while stocks last. Our expert staff will be able to gift wrap your purchase for free only at the perfume shop. Offer ends 13th of December. Ho, ho, ho! I've joined Repack's Team Green. You see, when you shop with a Repack member, you're supporting recycling in Ireland, and that could make a real difference this festive season. Look out for the Team Green Santa in Repack member stores. Join me on Repack's Team Green, and let's all play our part in recycling. Together, we can become environmental champions this Christmas. Now, don't end up on my naughty list. Visit repack.ie to find out more. Ho, 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 ho! Hello, I'm Liz O'Donnell, Chairperson of the Road Safety Authority. So far this year, 37 pedestrians have tragically lost their lives on our roads. That's already 10 more than in the whole of 2017. As a pedestrian, you're amongst the most vulnerable of all road users. So before you take a step, take steps to protect yourself. Be visible. Allow enough time to cross the road, especially now with the darker mornings and evenings. Always face oncoming traffic and stop to let it pass safely. And drivers, slow down. There could be a pedestrian in the shadows or around that bend. Always think pedestrians. A message from the Road Safety Authority. If you are in need of urgent medical care for conditions such as chest pain, respiratory, bowel or stomach problems, then you need the Medical Assessment Unit at the Bon Secours Hospital Dublin. It's so simple and worry-free. Ask your GP to refer you for same-day expert consultant opinion, where you will be assessed and either admitted for further investigation and treatment or discharged with a treatment plan. To find out more about the Medical Assessment Unit, visit bonsecours.ie forward slash Dublin. Bon Secours. Advanced medicine. Exceptional care. Rewarding your staff this Christmas? With One for All gift cards, you can gift anything from 15 to 500 euro completely tax-free. Accepted in over 8,500 outlets nationwide, including Pennies, Argos, M&S, Debenhams, online with Littlewoods Ireland and many more. Order at oneforallrewards.ie and you could win a daily prize worth over 100 euro. Terms and conditions apply. The One for All gift card is issued by GVS Prepaid Limited. GVS Prepaid Limited is authorised by the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK and regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland for Conduct of Business Rules. You can get all your Christmas shopping done in one place at Swords Pavilions. From treats and presents to food and gift cards, we've got it all. There's two hours free parking and it's so convenient, right off the M1. So grab your little helpers and head on over. Jingle all the way. Christmas at Source Pavilions. Festive fashion and fun for the whole family. Get Christmas wrapped up this year with Harvey Norman with gifts that they'll really love. 
Get the super slim and colourful HP Notebook with Intel processor, now only four nine nine, or get the sleek and lightweight Samsung seven inch tablet for only ninety nine euro, our lowest price ever. Or get the DJI Spark Fly More combo, offering everything drone enthusiasts need to get started, now only five five nine. So for more gift ideas, visit us online or in store. Christmas wrapped up. Love, Harvey Norman. Off the ball. This this is News Talk. You're welcome back to Thursday's football show. Nathan and Kev in studio. 53106 is the text number. So, Southampton have a new manager. They have confirmed the appointment of Ralf Hasenhutl, a Austrian 51-year-old who is going to take charge for the next couple of seasons following the sacking of Mark Hughes. Delighted to be joined on the line by Rob Daly to discuss the appointment. Evening, Rob. Evening, chaps. So... It's an interesting appointment, yet again from Southampton, going back to what they, probably a situation they were in three, four years ago when they were looking outside the obvious and just looking for survival and maybe planning a bit more long term. Ralf Hasenhutl, he made his name really with Leipzig, leading them to second place in the Bundesliga. He's been out of work though since last summer and since he left Leipzig. Does this look like a, a good match for you? Yeah, very much so. I'm very impressed that Southampton went with him. It, it is, as you sort of mentioned there, a bit of a heart back to what Southampton were doing in terms of not just player recruitment, but in terms of coaching recruitment. Pochettino was a bit left field at the time. Ronald Koeman was uh, a coach a lot of good teams are looking at. I feel like the appointment of Mark Hughes was not in line with the model that Southampton had had in place for some time. So I'm very excited to see Ralph Hasenhutl in the Premier League. I sort of touted him as a top six manager a couple of years ago with what he was doing with Leipzig mm. and um, I think it's a good opportunity all round for the club and for him as he was saying in his presser today. Rob, Rob you said left field but P Pellegrino was, was fairly left field I think when they went for him I think that's that was the thing that we, we were looking at overall to think well now they've gone back to as you say a left field appointment but is it not is it not uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is, is are they not necessarily going to say well look we're not going to go for someone that's actually going to be be a little bit more stable for us Mark Hughes would probably was was a little bit I would say 50-50 among supporters even at the time so why have they gone for him above others then now you make a good point and I, I would put for the case that Harson Huttle's exceptional circumstances for, for the following reason that he can build a team in two models, really. With with Ingolstadt, the team he was in charge of before Leipzig, they were bottom of Bundesliga 2, effectively the German Championship, got them promoted and kept them in the, in the Bundesliga by playing very solid defensive football, back four, midfield five, counter-attack set pieces. And then with Leipzig, he showed how he can play high-pressing, expansive football that we've seen from the likes of most notably Dortmund and Liverpool under Jurgen Klopp. So I think he went to Southampton because they talked a lot about how impressive he was in the interview. And I think he said, look, I can get you out of trouble one way and we can build the other way once we're safe. And I think I think that's what he's going to do, to be honest, with the mm. Southampton. I think they'll be safe now uh, with him in charge, to be honest. He's been described and probably somewhat lazily as an Austrian Klopp because of the high intensity style of play. But what you're saying then is maybe we shouldn't expect that straight away at Southampton, that he, he is quite open minded. He can go in, look at the group that's in front of him and look at alternative ways of playing something that suits probably for now just survival for the next six months. And then you sit down next May, June and plan for the next couple of years. Yeah, I think I think he'll be pragmatic, actually. The, the, the question, I suppose, is whether he feels he has enough of the season left to instill the pressing style, the attacking style that you'd like to see. I was at Wembley last night and I'm sure he was impressed by someone like Nathan Redmond. You know, in his Ingolstadt team, he had very quick wingers, the likes of Matthew Leckie, who's now at Hertha Berlin, who was very good on the counter-attack at being able to relieve the pressure when Ingolstadt was sitting back so deep. The other player I wanted to point out, actually, I was thinking about it today, was James Ward-Prowse. So Ward-Prowse is making maybe his second start of the Premier League season or something last night he wasn't really involved and his set pieces were excellent they caused Spurs real problems Southampton actually could have had two or three goals in that final half an hour now when he was at Ingolstadt uh, Ralph Hasenhutl's team defended a lot and relied a lot on crossing the ball into the penalty area it was about winning free kicks corners penalties and that's how they'd win games 1-0 2-1 and in that team he had a very good player to do that in Pascal Gross who we now see at Brighton. He was a brilliant set-piece taker. We now see in the Premier League how many assists he gets, how many chances he creates. And I wonder if he saw Ward-Prowse last night and thought, he'll, he'll do for me, 
because James Ward Prowse needs someone to save, not save his career because he's still a Premier League player, mm. but to turn him into the player many people thought he would be. And I think Carson Huttle might be that man. And there's no doubt that Southampton have been massively hit with the players that's been well documented over the last four or five seasons. But there is still some quality there. You mentioned two of them in Nathan Redmond and James Ward Prowse, who, when they've been playing their best football, have been in and around the England squad. Nathan Redmond as an England cap at this stage. So there is something there to work with. I guess when jobs like this come up at this time of the season, so Mark Hughes is one of those many managers that's on this endless cycle of moving through clubs. And, <laughs> and one of the reasons that a Sam Allardyce or Tony Pulis gets linked with Southampton is that they've proven that they can go in over a very short period of time and motivate players. And you look at Southampton over the last... 18 months, and a lot of those players look like they've been drifting. Like, overseeing them recently, looking at someone like Ryan, Ber Ryan Bertrand, looks like he's been stuck at the party and all his mates have gone home and they've gone to a better place and he's, he's missed his chance. To try and get that, get that fight back in the players, is that something he's shown as, as good as he can be tactically? Right now it feels, over the next month, when they probably have five, six games, two, three days between them, has he shown enough about him that he can get in, motivate instantly a group of players? Yeah, I think this is actually the primary comparison to Klopp above the pressing um, and above the style of play. It's the individual man management. He's he's a far more affable figure when he speaks in English, uh, a bit like Thomas Tuchel, actually, when he speaks in German. He's actually a little bit harsh with the media, but when he switches to English, he seems a bit nicer. And I think there's, that's the same with Hasenhüttl. This is a guy who says... He says a lot of the same things as Klopp about in terms of man management, being close to his players, putting an arm around them. And if I, you know, Kevin's been in a Premier League dressing room, I haven't. But the last three managers, I think, at Southampton, I think it would be fair to say they weren't the most inspirational, motivational mm. kind of guys in terms of Claude, P correct me if I'm wrong, Claude Puel, uh, Mauricio Pellegrino, who was also struggling a little bit with the language barrier, and then Mark Hughes, who didn't seem to be the kind of figure that they needed in that dressing room. So I think Hasan Huttle is the complete package for, for, for Southampton. I might be overselling it a little bit, but I think he can motivate that group of players. Uh, just something you said earlier about his, his job that he did at uh, Ingolstadt, where he was a, a little bit more pragmatic, Leipzig far more open. Do you, do you envisage... So you're, you're saying that it might, it might be a bit more pragmatic to start with. I, I just think immediately when you're saying that, Pepe Mel, when he went into, into West Brom and he, he, he went in straight away and tried to play open attacking football and they were getting caught out. And then he almost relied upon his coaching staff to change the system and go... I think Dean Kiley was in there and one or two others and said, look, we're going to yeah, play the same way. So do, do you think that that is probably the way that he can actually build to this, this end, uh, end of the season? Because I see he's got Cardiff, Huddersfield... West Ham this month, winnable games, I suppose, before, before, yeah. the, before the turn of the year. So I, I, it's, it's an interesting one how he's going to go about it, but what, what, what's the message that he would be relaying to the board then when he's taking the job? Is it a long-term uh, process or is it a, 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 an immediate plan to try and introduce his good attacking football? Yeah, I, th I, th I think he came in with the, here's the next two, three months and here's what I'll do and I'll be pragmatic and I'll get us out of trouble. And then I think he said the next three years, you will see the type of football that I want to play. And, I, and I'll point to something else about Ingolstadt. When they were in the German Championship, when they were in Bundesliga 2, they did play open, expansive football. They got to the Bundesliga and Harsen Huttel looked at his players and said, we don't have the money. They were backed by Audi, but there's bigger clubs in Germany backed by Audi, get more money. And I think he just said, right, I'm just going to have to be a bit more clever here. It's largely the same group. And I think he just realised just, they just had to be solid. They just had to be rock solid. And I remember commentating on loads of games that they just won 1-0. Literally win a penalty, score it, and not concede. For me, and I don't know what you think about this, obviously Van Dijk leaving was a massive blow in... Well, you say a massive blow. It was a lot of money in January. I think they do have problems at centre-back in terms of the actual quality there. I thought Ishida was very poor for the couple of goals against Manchester United at the weekend. Stevens has been in and out. Maybe he hasn't kicked on a Southampton would have liked. I don't know if he's actually got the quality at centre-back. Mm. And if that will be, having looked at the game last night, because he was there, he was there at Wembley, he didn't pick the side, obviously. I wonder if that will be the area he thinks, there's good central midfielders here. Hoiberg, well, Ward-Prowse, Stephen Davis can do a job. I've got wide players. We've got a couple of strikers when they're fit in Austin and Ings who know the, the Premier League. I've got a good goalkeeper. He's now part of the England setup. I think centre-back might be the, the area he tries tries to address in January 1st of all as well. What, what is it that the, war, the, the board there at Southampton actually expect, though? 
I, I would say this season, survival, isn't that it now? Well, I mean, I, I'm, if, I'm if, just if, saying in general because the, 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 the change of managers that they've had over the last few years, I know that managers have done well and left, so they, it's been thrown upon them. But what, what is the realistic expectations for Southampton over, over two or three years, say? I think what was interesting, what happened to Claude Puel, that he, he got them to uh, a League Cup final, mid-table-ish. I forget where they actually placed in the table under Puel. I want to say 10th to 8th, maybe. But the style of football rubbed the fans up the wrong way, as it has done a little bit at Leicester, I suppose, a similar profile in terms of job, aside from the fact they won the Premier League title. I think it is make us a mid-table established Premier League side, occasionally to reach for Europe, but play a style of football that we can mm. enjoy. And look, they, they had they had Pochettino, who I, I've seen all of Spurs games this season. I can't believe what a great job he does, what he gets out of his players, the brand of football he gets. Spurs haven't been flying this season. They've still won 11 of their 15 league games in a third. I think there's an expectation to play a good brand of football there now at Southampton, given, given what we've seen uh, previously as well. And if he is given the opportunity to reinforce in January, does past history suggest that he is a good eye for a player? Yeah, they were relatively shrewd in terms of the players they uh, they brought in. At Leipzig as well. Um, they obviously had a connection with RB Salzburg in Austria, so he had a, a, an easy route to very good, talented players. But they signed Timo Werner, the, who's now basically Germany's first choice number nine when he was there. I think, I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't, because Les Reed left, didn't he, last mm, month, Southampton, right. as I forget what his actual job title was, forgive me. But I, I don't know in terms of the recruitment what the process is now at Southampton and whether there has been a complete overhaul. But he, he clearly knows a good player. He knows how to motivate players. When Emil Forsberg was not fit enough for his liking at the start of the 2016 17 season, he just didn't play him for the first five games, basically, even though he was their best player. And Forsberg came back into the team and racked up a ridiculous amount of assists. So I think I think I think he'll get more out of the players that he's got already. Um, but I don't know who's making the calls there now. Forgive me, yeah. Southampton. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'd, I would give Hasenhutl a, a degree of power in that respect. From what you said there as well, and from a selfish point of view, and looking at the Irish angle here, and Michael Obafemi, probably our brightest young talent at just 18, and did very well on his debut against Manchester United at the weekend. You mentioned Timo Vermer. He's obviously not afraid to give young strikers a chance. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, I was, I was really sad not to see Obafemi last night. Injured, of course, for the... Spurs game. I think he might well have started up front. Manolo Gabbiadini did next to nothing uh, lead in the line. He will give young players a chance. And I think he'll look at Stevens and Ward Prowse in particular and say to them, weren't you supposed to be the guys that maybe went for 30, 40 million mm. two or three years ago? Everyone was talking about, especially Ward Prowse. And I think he'll find a way to motivate those guys. And even Nathan Redmond, you know, you. We all, I was looking back when I was researching the game last night before commenting on it, the, the Pep Guardiola stuff and what Guardiola said, that famous clip of when he rampaged him on the pitch. People know Nathan Redmond's underachieving. And I think that's the problem for Southampton, that there's just been a lack of motivation and the right energy in the dressing room. And some of those guys haven't lived up to expectations. They're all 24, 25. They've got, they've got, a, they've got a deliver now. Just before we let you go, Rob, the way you're talking then about Hasenhutl and where he could go with Southampton and the pedigree he already has. And he was one of the names touted potentially with taking over at Arsenal during the summer. I don't know how much was ever actually in that. But is your sense that this is a stepping stone, that this is maybe the next Maurizio Pochettino? Well, do you know what was interesting? Uh, the thing I saw, the exact quote, I won't remember it from Hasenhutl's press conference, but he said, I'm here to make a name for myself in England. Mm. I think that was the quote, forgive me if that's wrong, which suggests that he does have his eye on bigger and better things already. Look, he they did push, when he was Leipzig manager, they pushed Bayern for the German title, coached in the Champions League. He's had a taste for that. And Arsenal had a 50-man shortlist for that, for that job to replace Arsene Wenger. He must have been on that shortlist or someone that was massive oversight there. So I think Arsene Hüttel, like many people who take over at Southampton, like Ronald Koeman did before, they see it as the job for the next job. But you have to you have to do the business because the last few people at St Mary's haven't done it. Good stuff, Rob. Talk to you soon. Cheers, guys. You know, I'm a football man. Kevin's a football man, you know. And Joel's not. Now, Sorry, I'm a football man we too. Oh! 
what, what do you wear? Are you a boxer shorts boxers, man? Yeah, you boxers, boxers, yeah. Are boxers. you knickers man or what are you? That's one thing my wife's never had to buy me is boxer shorts or pants because I um, I don't wear any. Simple as that. I don't think I'm the only male out there that doesn't wear pants either. I think there's a lot of males. I know a lot of people that don't wear pants. It's 